I became pretty depressed and developed some unhealthy habits. I'd sleep at 5 a.m. and wake up in the afternoon, and then I would just spend all day scrolling on my phone and browsing the internet. I had zero drive to do anything because I just thought I was a victim of my circumstances, that there was no point for me to do or change anything. Welcome to our first episode of Be Queens. We interview Asian American women, CEOs, founders, and entrepreneurs who built businesses from the ground up. We hope their ability to bring their vision to life inspires listeners to also realize their dreams, whether in business or elsewhere. Our first guest is Vanessa Liu. Vanessa is a online fitness trainer and nutritionist who helps busy professionals eat healthy, consistently, and work out effectively. Her expertise has been featured in the New York Times, Forbes, and Pop Sugar. She's a former top tier trainer at Equinox, and prior to that, she worked in tech before making a career change. So, hello, Vanessa. Hello. Thank you so much for having me. I'm so honored and excited to be here. I'm so excited to have you here. You were literally the first person that came to mind when we were starting this season of our podcast. So, really excited to dig into your story. So we know each other because I was, am still one of your clients. Yes, 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 yes. You have been actually a very important part of my journey, which I'm sure we will talk about later. So I'm really excited to be doing this. Yeah, I wonder how much of Amanda I have informed, which we'll get into (laughs) later. I know that's like your target (laughs) client that you have developed. Yeah. So we're going to have three parts of our podcast. The first section is really to dig into your life story. Before digging into detail of your business, we want to hear about your childhood and how you grew up to see how that has influenced decisions you've made later as you've become an entrepreneur. So to kick things off, if you could just tell us about your childhood, what was it like? Okay, so I was born and raised in San Jose, California, along with my older brother, I've lived in the San Francisco Bay Area my entire life. I went to college at UC Berkeley and I live and work remotely in San Francisco. My parents are Chinese Vietnamese immigrants who fled Vietnam as war refugees during the Vietnam War. So they actually fled by boat. So they're Vietnamese boat people. And eventually they came to America My dad, he worked as a dishwasher at an old spaghetti factory restaurant. And my mom would start work at 5 a.m. because she drove a food truck. And my mom is 4'11", barely 100 pounds. So imagine she's driving this massive food truck. And this was way before food trucks became super cool. So I grew up very modestly and they modeled a really strong work ethic to me. And now that I'm in my early thirties, I've really come to appreciate my childhood roots. That's pretty amazing. Like we've heard the immigration story, but I think if you really think about someone starting dishwashing or driving a food truck, those are not easy jobs to have off the bat. Yeah. I think it takes so much courage and resilience, seeing those qualities modeled in them have really influenced me throughout my entire life, so much so along the entrepreneurial journey. Yeah, you mentioned that now that you're in your early 30s, you've really seen how their work ethic and the things that they have modeled have come into your own life. How do you think those things have mirrored themselves or influenced your life in building this business today? Yeah, aside from just their strong work ethic, like that has absolutely influenced me, but it also influenced me in the sense that I see entrepreneurship as a way to honor my parents because they didn't have the same opportunities I did. They moved to a new country. They were separated from their core family. They had no money, had to learn English, had to learn American culture. And on top of that, they had a ton of unresolved trauma from being war refugees, they really didn't have the luxury to pursue their dreams and take risks. And when they had me and my brother, they continued to sacrifice so much to set us up for a better life. So 
pursuing entrepreneurship is a way for me to honor my parents. It's a way to say thank you for providing me with security and stability. And because my parents provided me with those things, I can afford to take more risks in life. That's such an interesting reaction to that because the other narrative that we hear often is I had to pursue something that was stable nine to five, but you obviously are doing your own thing and honoring them differently in terms of taking risks. So did you ever feel that pressure to do something more stable or was that not how you responded to your parents' upbringing? I for sure did. Like most Asian Americans, I had that go to college and pursue a stable career as a doctor or lawyer. And it's hard because on one sense, sometimes we feel this obligation to our parents because they sacrifice so much for us. But for me, that obligation has turned into a way to honor my parents instead of feeling obligated. It's turned into yeah. an honor. And to me, stability and security, like my basic needs are met. So it's almost like we know that our parents at the end of the day, they want us to be happy and they think happiness is security and stability. But because we now have security and stability, the next step is like, it's like pursuing our dreams or taking risks. And I think that's what's moved me from a state of security and stability to taking risks. Yeah, it, it sounds like the Maslow's hierarchy of needs where yeah. once you hit your basic needs, then you can move on to the next thing. And for you, that was going after this dream that you had. I was going to say, like, it's such a privilege for us to be able to do that. So I don't want to discount that at all. As Asian Americans, we are in such a fortunate position to even be able to pursue that. Yeah. And I'm so amazed at that mindset because if you respond with the, I need to do something stable, it can feel more constraining and an obligation, as you mentioned, but the way that you're responding with, no, I'm going to follow what I feel called to do. That's just this freeing mindset. That's more about the potential and how you can make an imprint. And that really is the best way, as you're saying, to be able to honor your parents is through your life and through your career. You're really trying to make new shit happen. <laughs> yeah. And I didn't even think about it the way that you said it. It feels like an obligation when we have to pursue security and stability because it's not our true selves. And so of right. course, we're going to feel constrained into this obligation. So that's a, yeah. that's a really interesting way to put it. Yeah. So you could have been interested in anything, but I'm curious, what was it about nutrition and health in particular that got you into this field? Oh my gosh. Okay. So I, I've definitely always, 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 always loved all things, nutrition, fitness, health ever since I was a little kid, but something that really solidified my love and passion was that in my twenties, I went through a pretty dark period. My boyfriend of five years broke up with me and I realized that I didn't have many friends outside of our relationship, or more importantly, I didn't even have an identity outside of our relationship. My dad was also diagnosed with bone marrow cancer. And as a whole, my family was experiencing a lot of turmoil. And I became pretty depressed and developed some unhealthy habits. I'd sleep at 5 a.m. and wake up in the afternoon, and then I would just spend all day scrolling on my phone and browsing the internet. I had zero drive to do anything because I just thought I was a victim of my circumstances, that there was no point for me to do or change anything. Mm -hmm. And okay, it sounds a bit silly, but one day I watched Legally Blonde and anyone who's watched Legally Blonde knows this iconic scene that I'm about to share. But I saw the scene where Reese Witherspoon says, exercise gives you endorphins, endorphins make you happy. And when I heard that, something clicked for me. And I was like, wow, I remember I was the most happy when I was physically active and taking care of my body. So I started lifting weights again and eating healthy more consistently because I just wanted those endorphins. I just wanted to be happy again. Mm -hmm. And what's really amazing is that weightlifting gave me a sense of accomplishment. Eating healthy gave me more energy. My body became so much stronger and more fit. And my habits and lifestyle, they 
change dramatically. You know, the word that comes to mind is vitality. Mm -hmm. Like I had so much vitality in my life again, and I experienced so much breakthrough in my health that it led me to stop being a victim and take ownership of my life again, because Mm -hmm. that physical strength translated to mental and emotional strength. So to make a long story short, I truly believe in my bones that when you build a healthy lifestyle with healthy habits, it can affect every other area of your life. It can improve your work. It can improve your relationships. And that whole experience inspired me to leave tech, switch careers and become a fitness trainer so I could help others experience those same breakthroughs. Wow. Let me go to the gym right now. <laughs> list, I know. List some I, dumbbells. Was, I know. I was like, as I was saying, weightlifting gives you a sense of accomplishment. I was thinking Jonah totally has experienced <laughs> this as well. It is just this huge sense of accomplishment that you feel. Yeah. So first of all, amazing story. Obviously you went through a really tough time and it's really cool to see how you took this part of your life that you can control and how that has impacted you to feel stronger physically, but also the translation to the rest of your life. One thing that really stands out to me is that exercise and nutrition, as you laid it out, really is something that we can control right now. A lot of things in life, what happens to us or illness, like you mentioned in the immediate, it's really hard to feel like you have control over certain circumstances. But in terms of your nutrition and your health, like I can make the decision to go to the gym right now. So I think that really stood out to me in terms of like, this is an incremental thing that you can start doing now that has these downstream effects to feeling like, wait, if I can lift weights at the gym, maybe I can go after this goal at work. And maybe I can go talk to that cute guy at the bar and whatever it is, you know, I can see it being a reinforcing thing where it really helps build your confidence. Yeah, absolutely. Like you said, there are so many things that we can't control in life. And I thought I just don't have control. Like I'm a victim. I just thought I was a victim. But when I saw things that are within my control, like we can't control everything, but there are certain decisions, actions that we can control. When we do that and we see things starting to change, it gives us this confidence in overall ability to change. So I think you nailed it. And I'm curious, is that something that you see when you're working with your clients too, that kind of transformation? Yeah, absolutely. An example is when they achieve a personal record in a gym, when Mm -hmm. they have lifted a certain amount of weight that they've never lifted before, it kind of opens their eyes, like the light bulb moment where they're like, if I could do this, what else can I do? And there have been so many clients who, when they have achieved a healthy lifestyle and made it habitual their relationships improved and that like they've gotten more confidence in their dating life and now they're engaged and getting married or they decided to make a career change or pursue something else at work that will help elevate them so i am such a proponent that it truly translates to every other area of your life that's funny because I was reflecting back on my year and we started working together two years ago and I'm in a committed relationship. Oh, I changed yeah, jobs yeah, yeah. last year. So yes. you know what? I'm living proof of some of the transformation that could happen yes. outside of just in the gym. Okay. Makes tons of sense. Why nutrition and health? And that's like so inspiring. So after hearing about how you grew up and how that has affected your decision to go into nutrition and health, we're going to pivot now to how you decided to start a business. Let's transition to learning more about the business that you started. So you mentioned that you went through a career change. You started out in tech. So can you tell us more about what that journey was like going from tech to fitness? Oh, man. Okay. So I've had some experience in nutrition and public health before. In college, I majored in nutrition and public health. And Mm -hmm. while in college, I did physical therapy, strength and conditioning, sports medicine, nutrition research. So I kind of have worked in that area. 
Right. But after graduation, like every young 20 something in the Bay Area, I decided to go into tech. So I worked in software sales for the majority of my 20s. And when I eventually left tech, I started off by teaching fitness classes on ClassPass and at UCSF. Then at nights and weekends, I would train private clients that were referred to me by friends. And when I wasn't teaching or training, I actually worked at the retail store, Athleta, the athleisure clothing brand, which is a fun fact a lot of people don't know about me. I worked in retail briefly to supplement my income. So my first year of leaving tech was a lot of hustle. I went from basically sitting at my desk all day in tech to being on my feet all the time in fitness and retail. And eventually I got hired as a personal trainer at Equinox. So all that hustle that you were doing with the classes and training people, like, did you already quit your job at that point when you were doing those things? Yeah, I had quit my job, left in August. And then by September, October, I was teaching classes and training private clients. So I didn't really have much of a break. I just started hustling. I don't really subscribe to hustle culture now, but I think during that time, I think it was it's called this fresh start effect where you're just like excited about the possibility of a fresh start. So I think right. I was so driven by my excitement to do this. And it was like a buzzy energy that I had. Yeah, I was going to ask, that must have been scary leaving a nine to five. And then it, it doesn't sound like there was anything lined up. Like you had quit. And then the next month you're like, all right, I'm going to start hustling. And that cold quit actually helped you kind of like hustle harder with that fresh start mindset. But of course, in hindsight, it sounds like, yeah, I quit and I decided to do this with my calling. But for myself, that would be really nerve wracking. I know. And it's so funny. Whenever someone asks me this, I reflect back to that time. And I'm also so surprised that it wasn't as nerve wracking as I thought it would be. Yeah. Well, like I was definitely nervous, but it was more of that buzzy energy and excitement. But I think now that I think back on it, I'm like, I guess that truly makes me believe that this is my God given calling. And right. then I also think going through everything I talked about earlier with depression and feeling like I was a victim of my circumstances, I was like, dang, if I could get out of that, if I can like pull myself out of that, if I fail in fitness, I feel like I was already at the bottom and I can't go yeah. any lower. So I think having that experience helped a lot. Yeah, that like confidence you developed with your physical health, it sounds like that translated to this confidence to be able to jump ship career wise and to start something new. I honestly think that I could see that being a big hindrance for people that have something that they want to work on, where the illusion of leaving something stable, not that everyone needs to quit their job to start something new, you can always do something on the side. But to your point, the self confidence building, but also the sense of calling, it just felt right. It sounds like it was just like, this is just how it was supposed to go. Yeah, definitely. Okay, so then you hustled and you eventually got hired at Equinox. Were you at Equinox for a while before you decided to start your own business? Three years. I believe it okay. was three years. Okay, and then walk me through that transition from starting your career at Equinox, growing that, and then eventually deciding to start your own business. Okay, and Jonah, you are definitely part of what inspired me to start my own business, so we'll get to that, but I'll give some context first. So I had been with Equinox for about two and a half years. So I grew a lot with Equinox. The way you get promoted as a trainer is there are tiers you achieve, like tier one, tier two, similar mm -hmm. to how in tech there are levels or ladders like L1, L2. Mm -hmm. And I was going through the evaluation process of becoming a tier X trainer, which is the highest tier. Like, it's so cool. They don't even give it a number. They give you a letter to your ex. <laughs> and I even remember reading the marketing copy and it said, tier X trains celebrities, athletes, CEOs, and that Jason Derulo has a tier X trainer. And I was like, wow. oh my gosh, I want to train Jason Derulo. The dream, the dream. The dream. <laughs> <laughs> so anyways, the point is, Tier X was the end goal for me. It's where I saw myself. I didn't even think about starting my own fitness business at all. Mm -hmm. But then the pandemic hit. And in March 2020, gyms shut down because we all sheltered in place. 
So for the rest of 2020, I started training clients virtually. And mm -hmm. one of my friends, Grace, was really the catalyst in helping me develop an online training program. She really saw a lot of potential in me that I frankly didn't see in myself. So during the pandemic, we started this pilot program to prove out whether or not we could get results for people online. And mm -hmm. Jonah, this is where you come in because you were part of our pilot program. Yes. And Grace was coaching me in getting my fitness approach out there to the world. Even today, it's hard to describe her role. She wore so many hats. She was like product manager, business coach, career coach, partner. So through this pilot program, we put together a group of women to train virtually. We would gather feedback and that helped us validate our offer and our approach. And we achieved some really great results for clients online. And it made mm -hmm. me realize I have a unique approach that works online. Yeah. And then when vaccines were released and people started going back to the gym, I felt like I was at this crossroads and had to decide if I was going to go back and continue the TRX evaluation or pursue my own thing. And I'd been at Equinox three years by now. And, and you're still I bring working up, there while you had started yes. this business. Okay. Correct. I was still working at Equinox. I was still an employee there through the pandemic. Um, mm -hmm. Luckily, they didn't let any trainers go, at least on my team, they kept all of us. Mm -hmm. And so I was still employed by Equinox while I was doing this pilot program with Grace. And I bring up T-Rex and Equinox because I want people to know it wasn't an easy decision. Like I would have loved to train the Jason Derulo's of the world. That's the dream. Right. And sometimes we have to make a decision like between two things that are really good. Right. Eventually I saw success in the pilot program that gave me confidence in myself as an online trainer, independent of a gym. And I also love the idea of being able to train anyone from anywhere, making mm -hmm. my approach to fitness and nutrition more accessible because you didn't have to be a member at an expensive gym to work with me. So right. it was the accessibility of online training and the success from the pilot program, those two things inspired me to pursue my own fitness business. Got it. I'm seeing themes in these pivotal moments. You having really had the self-confidence to move on to the, like the next stage, whether that was in working on your personal fitness to make that career change or Grace, this elusive person, Grace, who seems to have been this catalyst for you to start this pilot program. What's her day job, by the way? Is she a business coach or something? She's a product manager. She's a product okay. manager. And you guys were just friends and she saw this opportunity for you? Yeah, we had met at church and we weren't super great friends when we met, but when she heard that I was a trainer, she had been going through this health journey herself. She had never found something that works for her. She was evaluating different gyms. And then one day she was like, hey, can we just like have lunch and like talk about health stuff? Yeah. And she had come over to my apartment. We had Chipotle and I whipped out my Sharpie and I whiteboarded stuff to her. And since she's a product manager, she's like, oh my gosh, I love whiteboarding. Yeah. And I think she was like, everything you're walking me through, no one has ever done yeah. this the way you think about health and fitness. So I think she saw a lot of potential in me. She's like, you have to get this out to the world. And so that's why I really call her my catalyst. She has impacted my journey so much and has given me so much encouragement and confidence. And I imagine for a lot of people who are trying to start something new, having someone in your corner who roots for you, who believes in you and who will encourage you to take that step, that can be so powerful when there's a lot of self-doubt or even just being unaware of your own skills, right? Having someone else shed light on that could be just so powerful to move you along. And then the other transition working in Equinox to leaving, the pilot program really helped you develop confidence because it sounds like there was a good momentum that had developed while you were working on that. Yeah, absolutely. So what is it that makes your approach to nutrition and fitness different? Like the thing that Grace was like, wow, I haven't heard this somewhere. The thing that has probably led you to success in your pilot program and in expanding your business. What are those little kernels that are really differentiating you from other fitness trainers in the market? I'll say two things. One is that I think one of my strengths is I 
see a person holistically. So let's take fat loss, for example. There are a lot of trainers out there who will just give you a meal plan to follow to the T. They'll just give you your macro numbers and you follow that to a T. Or they'll be like, eat nothing but chicken and broccoli for 90 days and you'll lose weight. I think my strength is seeing someone as a whole person and helping them lose fat in a way where they don't let go of their cultural identity, their social life, and they really build it as a lifestyle. For example, I can see that Amanda wants to lose fat, but she wait is who's who's Amanda? Oh, okay, Amanda. <laughs> <laughs> She's the marketing persona that we created. Amanda <laughs> is what I call an ideal customer. And she is 28 years old and she lives in a major metro area like San Francisco, LA, New York. She went to a top tier college and she works in tech or finance. She loves brunching, loves traveling, loves going to music festivals. She basically is living that modern millennial lifestyle and she has tried a bunch of different diets a bunch of different eating approaches but has never found something that works for her she's also taken a bunch of classes like soul cycle berries orange theory but she's never really latched on to weightlifting and so i call her amanda and what helped you build that persona i think it was half seeing me so amanda is like plot twist, I used to be an Amanda. We're all Amandas. <laughs> We're all Amandas. <laughs> and so I would say me being Amanda and then seeing my friends and clients that I worked with, slowly when I looked at my clients at Equinox, I was like, whoa, you guys all kind of fall under similar buckets. You all have Amanda characteristics. Yeah. And when I look at my own community and my own network and my own friend group, like a lot of them are Amandas. And so I think part of my strength is seeing Amanda holistically and being mm -hmm. able to understand that, let's say Amanda is Asian and she loves Asian food. And she always thought, I can't lose weight because I love Asian food. Or I understand that Amanda loves eating cake because growing up, her mother made her a homemade birthday cake every year and eating cake makes her think of her mother or understanding that her job is go, go, go. She is in back-to-back -back Zoom meetings all day. She doesn't have time to go in the kitchen and whip up a perfectly Instagrammable meal. Mm. And so I think I'm able to have a lot more empathy. I understand why it's so hard for you to build this healthy lifestyle. How can we do it in a way that it truly feels like it's your routine and your lifestyle instead of trying to What's that saying? Force a round peg in a square hole? Mm -hmm. Well, I can definitely relate as an Asian person who loves rice and all the different foods out there. And I personally, as one of your clients, the thing that really resonated with me was that you're coaching your clients to make behavioral changes. It's not a fad diet. You're not just trying to reach a certain goal. In fact, you and I didn't even, we didn't even talk about weight at all as a measure. I never weighed myself and reported that to you. And so I think that focus on the whole lifestyle and also making behavioral changes and understanding what your client is going through, that to me sounded really different from the things that I was seeing on YouTube or from books or whatever about health and nutrition that just, like you said, chicken breast and broccoli. Yeah, definitely. It works when Amanda can bridge that gap with my guidance and coaching. So it's like, how can I help Amanda reflect back on her routine and her journey and experiment in like a safe space so that we find out what sticks and what doesn't stick? Yeah. Quick plug for Vanessa's newsletter, because there's a lot of great info about all these lifestyle changes and even little tidbits of motivation. How can people join your newsletter? They can go on my website, www.vanessavlu.com. It's my L-I-U. Correct. L-I-U. It's my first name, 
the initial V liu.com and there's a tab that you'll see when you go on where you can sign up for my newsletter please follow she has a lot of great gifs and also you're a great writer i just love to read it it's like getting an email from a close friend and you don't really get a lot of those these days so yeah it's just a good read yeah thank you for that i really appreciate that because i truly will try to write like i'm just talking to amanda Mm -hmm. which i think makes it like you said feel very personal Yeah. So we've gotten into your business and what makes you different compared to other fitness trainers in the market. So how's your business doing now? What are you focused on? The business is doing really well in that I have a full client roster and I am able to make this my full-time job. Right now, my biggest priority is marketing. So even though I have experience in sales, marketing is hard for me. I like writing email newsletters, so I will continue to do that. But I think part of the reason I like writing it is because I don't have to show my face and right. and be on camera. And it's like a one-to-one email, me to another person. I am scared of creating content and putting myself out there because it opens me up to criticism. I'm mm-hmm. a recovering people pleaser. And if I share my point of view and I'm unapologetic about it. The fear in my head is that people are going to think I'm cringe. But overall, I see this business becoming not just Vanessa the trainer. I have some ideas floating around in my head and I need to crystallize it further, but I'm developing more of a vision or umbrella movement that can unite everyone, meaning it can unite my future team as I hire people and it can unite my future clients or customers, and then any services or products I release fall under this movement. That jump, you went from of being single trainer, single client to now I'm going to scale this thing. How do I think about not just representing myself, but a movement and a business and even thinking about future teammates like that's Amazing. That's a big jump. And I really love the pivot moment that you're currently focused on. Yeah, definitely. And I think Grace would be so proud because she would always tell me that I'm too tactical and I need more vision. And I feel Mm -hmm. like now I'm really stepping into this role of being more of a visionary. And I don't have any plans to go back to a gym and I don't think I want to go back to a gym. So how can I make this last three, five, 10 years? So that's where I'm at right now. That's awesome. And you mentioned that fear of coming across as cringe or putting yourself out on the internet. So how are you challenging against those negative thoughts? Maybe you're still wrestling with it. I am still wrestling with it, but it is a fear that I'm working through right now in therapy and through journaling. I'll say a couple things. One, an overarching thing I remember that actually my client Yvonne recently told me, she was like, the sad truth of, social media nowadays of content marketing, you are going to come off as cringe to some people, but that's okay because those just aren't your people and you have to find your people. So that's something that she said recently that I have been keeping in mind. Mm -hmm. I'll also say that I think part of my fear is not having credibility. So even though I wasn't that nervous about leaving tech to go into fitness. I was more so excited, but leaving Equinox, I was so freaking scared and nervous. And the reason is because I knew I wouldn't have a brand name like Equinox under me Mm -hmm. anymore. And my, my fear is not being seen as a credible personal trainer because I'm kind of a petite-ish, slim Asian woman with a high voice. Like I don't have a lot of swag, so I don't look or sound like most trainers out there, but being at Equinox, I felt like it gave me a lot of credibility. Like, damn, you're a legit trainer, even though you don't look or sound like most trainers. Mm -hmm. But I think publicity has helped with that because I knew that if I was gonna be an online trainer, people were gonna Google me and I wanted myself to pop up on Google. So that has helped a lot with the credibility piece. Yeah. And one of my clients, Kim said, I have such smart clients. They give such great advice. But Kim said, like, you know, you have all of these things already. You're an Equinox trainer. 
you used to work in tech, you went to a great college, you have so many testimonials, you have publicity, you were in the New York Times, what else do you need? At this point, you just have to accept and be proud of what you already have instead of looking at what you lack. So that's something recently that I've been thinking about also. Yeah, that's cool to see how you are working through an active fear that's going on. Not only that, but that your clients are coming to bat for you, you know, like who could be the best proponents of your work than your clients. And also it's not like you're already taking these steps to scale with the publicity and the press outreach that you've already done. So you're taking the steps to get there. That's really amazing. Thanks for talking us through your business. We would like to take some time now to hear about your reflections on your journey so far. So the first question, what are some of the type of mind reflections that come to mind as you kind of look back on your entrepreneurship journey? As I reflect back, two things come to mind. The first thing is I notice that the mindset piece is the hardest. The hardest part hasn't been business strategy or tactics, but it's having to manage my thoughts and emotions. For example, the fear that I just shared about putting myself out there. Mm -hmm. It's been being able to take action and move forward despite feeling fearful. For me, a large part of being successful as an entrepreneur is having a good level of emotional stability. Mm -hmm. And the second thing is that it's important to have a strong point of view It doesn't have to be earth shattering, but like you want to stand for something. And as a recovering people pleaser, that has also been hard for me, but I have been able to develop a stronger point of view that I really believe in going back to like that vision and movement piece. And when I can share my point of view with other people and other people resonate with it, I realize, oh, wow, I am truly impacting people in a positive way. Yeah, that's awesome. I could see a lot of themes around self-management and growth. And it's not like you have been working on this with a co-founder. You're actually doing this on your own. So the discipline and the perseverance it takes to continue to do this every day, that's really impressive to see. Yeah. And has your perception of yourself changed or evolved now that you look back on the journey that you've been on so far? Yeah, I'll say a couple of things. One is that when it comes to food, I have been leaning into my Asian American roots a lot more. Mm. The pandemic played a huge role in this because during the pandemic, I moved home with my parents temporarily and I haven't been home since my college days. So now I was an adult. I was 30 when I moved home. Yeah. So one of my point of views when it comes to food is I think that there's a very narrow definition of what's considered healthy eating that often excludes other cultures and lacks diversity. For example, there's a lot of emphasis on foods that are popular for white non-immigrant Americans like kale salads. So a lot of people like me, like you, who are Asian, grew up thinking that our cultural foods can't be considered healthy because we don't eat salads normally. We eat rice, we eat liver, we eat kidney. We eat so many other things. And how can I still honor and respect my culture while still being healthy? And I think there are ways to do that. I used to only view food through the lens of nutrition. Like how can I maximize the most nutrients? But now I see food as comfort, as culture, as celebration. And so I think leaning into my identity as an Asian American more has influenced my point of view on food. And when I share that with other people, they totally resonate with it as well. That is something that has evolved over these past few years. That really resonates with me because I came back from Korea recently and I forgot how much I love eating soup in the morning because that's part of Korean culture. And so when I came back, I was like, oh, I'm going to start doing that for myself and start eating soup in the morning. And I texted you about it and you're like, yeah, go for it. Sometimes it helps people control their cravings more if they have a bigger breakfast. And in the past, I always thought like, oh, no, I didn't think of it as diet food, quote unquote, right? But now 
I think with more experience and definitely from your support, it's truly about lifestyle changes that incorporate who I am, which food is a big part of it. So that's really cool to hear. So you mentioned how things have shifted for you in terms of how you view food. Another common topic that comes to mind for immigrants can be around money as well. So I'm just curious about going from a consistent nine to five job where you have a salary to Equinox and now you're managing your own business. I imagine there's these shifts around how you thought about money. Can you tell me more about that? Yes, I'm so glad you bring that up and you asked this question. So for those who are listening, if your parents are immigrants, you will probably resonate with this. But growing up, we're usually only taught to save money or to not spend money. There's a personal finance book by an author named Ramit Sethi. And he talks about how most of us have a scarcity mentality driven by fear. We're only ever taught this fear of losing money or this fear of not making enough. No one ever teaches us how to spend money strategically or even to enjoy our money. Mm -hmm. So I grew up with this Asian immigrant mindset of save as much as possible. In my own business, I have pretty high profit margins, which I thought was a good thing, which yes, in most cases you want healthy profit margins. But the first ever call I had with my accountant, she looked at my finances and was like, your profit margins are way too high. No wonder you feel burnt out. You're never going to be able to scale if you're not spending money, investing money back into the business. And that was such a light bulb moment for me. Now that I think about it, I'm like, that's so obvious and true. You have to spend money to invest back in your business. But during that time, Mm -hmm. I was like, I didn't even know having too high profit margins. I didn't know that was the thing because I only ever operated from this mindset of save money, save money, save money. So Mm -hmm. ever since I launched my own online business, it has been tremendously important for me to shift my perception of money and view it more as a tool, a tool to help me scale, a tool to give me convenience, a tool to bring me value. Yeah, it's coming your way because you are giving value to other people. And so the way that it is paid to you is through the form of money. And so in that same vein, it can be a tool that's used to help grow your business. So that's such a good reframe. I think about this a lot sometimes where I'm like, oh, I'm gonna go buy this other thing to save a dollar. And I'm like, wait, should I think about save a dollar? Or should I think about investing a thousand dollars? You know what I mean? (laughs) Exactly. So definitely hear you on the mindset piece. Okay. So now that we've talked through all these experiences, how do you think you have personally grown through all these experiences? One of the ways I've grown is earlier. I said that my fear was lacking credibility because I don't look or sound like most trainers out there. I wasn't a D1 athlete. I'm somewhat athletic, but I'm not this bodybuilder. I'm not a performance athlete. But one of the point of views that I've developed that has come from my tech background, has come from being a bit more academic, is this belief that sweating and soreness aren't indicators of a good workout. Mm -hmm. And I want to help people ditch the belief that exercise must be exhausting in order to be effective. And my experiences in college, in tech, and in not being a D1 athlete and not being a bodybuilder has helped me develop that point of view that I think really resonates with a lot of people because now I can train people in a way that is a lot more attainable where we're chill, but we're focused at the same time, where they can truly see why good form makes a difference and how that translates over to you being fit and strong in your everyday life. And so that's the first way I've grown. Mm -hmm. And the second way is my sense of purpose has grown. I truly feel a God-given calling to help people build better habits for better health. And working in tech sales, I always felt like I had to prove myself by hitting a monthly quota, but Mm -hmm. now I can more clearly view my work as an act of loving service to other people. And to be clear, I'm not suggesting that working in software sales or tech can't be an act of service. It absolutely can. And it absolutely is for a lot of people, 
but what I'm doing now, teaching people how to eat healthy consistently, how to work out effectively, how to take ownership of their health and habits, I truly feel like that's my God-given calling. And as I'm leaning into that calling, it allows me to work from a place of love and service instead of working from a place where I want to prove myself or glorify myself or make a certain amount of money. So my sense of purpose has grown a lot. That's awesome. And I also imagine with being able to expand that sense of purpose, it gives you more fuel or mission behind scaling your business because then you can reach more people and also putting yourself out there because it's not, I don't mean this in a rude way, but it's not about you, right? It's about the people that you're trying to service. And so when it comes to putting yourself out there on the internet, okay, you might get some people with some negative comments, but ultimately it's not about how people are reacting to you. It's about all the people that you're able to touch with the messages that you have to convey to them. Yeah, absolutely. You're a hundred percent correct. Like one of the ways I'm working through that fear of putting myself out there is I think about Amanda is out there and she is Brazilian and she grew up eating her grandmother's Brazilian cooking. And she needs to know that she can still be healthy and eat Brazilian food. And if I don't put myself out there, if I don't create content so that Amanda will eventually find me, I am not leaning into my calling. Yeah, a hundred percent. I dream of a day where the healthy versions of food on Instagram will not just be chicken breast, but it'll be all the different ethnic foods that are out there based on your influence. Last question, what's one piece of advice you have for women who have a dream or are thinking about pursuing a dream and they're not quite there to take action yet? So earlier I said that for me, the mindset piece has been the hardest part of my entrepreneurial journey. So my advice for those who want to pursue a dream is to take care of your mental and emotional health. Don't dismiss it as insignificant because all the business strategies and tactics you need to turn your dreams into reality are out there on the internet. You could literally Google anything. You could Google how to run a pilot program and validate your idea. You could Google how to get publicity. So if information was all that we needed for anything, no one would have problems. But information is not what you need. You need more courage because so mm. often what is stopping us is our fears, doubts, and anxieties. That's what's been stopping me from scaling the fear of putting myself out there and the fear of spending money. Mm-hmm. So I want to speak encouragement to anyone who's struggling with those fears right now. Learn how to manage your thoughts and emotions, do what you need to do practically to grow mentally and emotionally stronger and develop more courage, whether that's investing in professional therapy or counseling, whether it's journaling, prayer, or hiring a coach or having a few go to people who can speak encouragement into your life. To be clear, the goal isn't to become unshakable and to never struggle with our thoughts or feelings. We are all human. We live in a broken world and it's not shameful to have these struggles. You are not any less of a person. But the point I'm trying to make is to address your negative thoughts and emotions so you can respond to them in more positive and constructive ways. So to sum it up, my advice, learn to manage your thoughts and emotions so that you can develop more courage and pursue your dreams. I love what you said about It's not the how, it's not like there's a secret sauce between someone who pursues their dreams and someone who doesn't. It's actually more about the self-management and the care. And and that's very doable. I wouldn't expect any less from a fitness trainer than to give a very incremental doable step. (laughs) Yeah, absolutely. Well, Vanessa, it's been awesome to hear about your story and to chat with you today. We appreciate you and loved having you on our show. I'm so honored to be a guest and thank you again for letting me share my story. I hope it inspires anyone listening to not only work out and eat healthy, but to take action to pursue their dreams. If you'd like to learn more about Vanessa and her business, go to www.vanessavlu.com. 
And you can also follow her on Instagram at Vanessa V. Liu, L-I-U, for free fitness and nutrition advice. And also, thanks for tuning in to the first episode of Be Queens. Please leave a review on Spotify or wherever you listen to podcasts. Stay tuned for the next one.